What's up everyone, Manny from Motor Million here. And as you can tell, we have a little change in scenery. We're here at Motocorse in Fort Lauderdale. They pronounce it Motocorse. In Italian, it would be Motocorse, but uh, we're in the US, so we're gonna call it Motocorse. It's owned by my good buddy, Chris Boy. Other than, you know, the business relationship we have is a good friend of mine. And uh, we try to use the services as much as possible. We're here today to get our tires installed on our Aussie Racing Forged Titanium wheels. And I wanted to take this chance to show this beautiful shop that he has because he has got a lot of cool stuff inside. I'm sure you guys wanted to see it. And I also wanted to give him a big shout out because it's such a little gem that we have here in South Florida that if you guys are anywhere in South Florida, they're Ducati specialists. I know people from all over the country send their Ducatis over here because of the type of work they do. But even if you own a non-Ducati bike, they do that kind of work here too. So let's head on inside and take a look. So when you walk inside, this is the reception area and the cool stuff starts already over here. Forget about what's in the back, but there's so many cool stuff here like this 79 Supersport 900. And I don't know a lot of the old stuff by Ducati, but I know this is cool because this fuel tank that you see here, it's a fiberglass fuel tank. And this side opening here that's left unpainted, it's so you could tell your fuel level. And one of the bikes that was sent out to Cycle World, it wasn't a Super Sport 900, but it had the same tank. They forgot a fly inside the resin. It's not inside the tank, but it was actually like dead inside the resin. And they sent the bike to Cycle World for their review. I think it was Cycle World. So when you see this bike, it's kind of cool. Other than I bet you it has a lot of history and everything that you guys probably can, can look up. But this is uh, one of the things. But one thing I want to show you guys that really resonates with the modern world Ducatis that we have right now is the Super Mono. This bike is extremely rare. It's one of 65 or 67, it's still a debated topic. And this is a 95, and it was the last year that they were made. Apparently they made two more between 95 and 97, but um, that's still not confirmed. But if you look at this bike, it's crazy because it's the first bike to have carbon fiber subframe, carbon fiber rear sets, the carbon fiber rear fender, front fender, the air box, first Ducati to have Ram Air. If you come take a look over here, even the shrouding on the, on the cluster is all carbon. And for its time, this bike was extremely ahead of its time. And going to the engine, so the Super Monos were, Super Mono meaning it's the Super Mono series that used to run, it's not just a Ducati that had a Super Mono. All the other manufacturers had Super Mono bikes to go racing. Their single cylinder bikes, they started off as 550 cc's. This being a 95 is a 570, I believe it's a 570 cc. And if you come and take a look at it, so the casing is off a, a, a two cylinder Ducati, but this is a one cylinder. But inside right here, there's a hump. And on that hump, there's actually an other rod just to balance the engine from the rotating masses that are in there so it's a single cylinder with two rods in there and the point of the other rod is just to balance the bike out and this bike is all stock except the quick shifter that it has on it it's you know these are uh one in 65 you know just imagine at the back you guys if you come here you probably won't get to see this because this is most likely off limits to customers but we're going to show you all the bikes that are here for service and there's a lot of cool stuff and if you look up there those are Chris's trophies right on top of the paint booth I asked him how many is there he said he's never counted them but we know that he's won 125 races in one year riding a Ducati so that goes to say how much experience is behind this whole name. And uh, that's a crazy amount of races in one year. I'm not, this is not the wrong number. It's the correct number. 125 races in one year. That's crazy. He mentioned that he was racing nine races a weekend at a point. So it's, uh, it's insane. And they were all on Ducatis. And if you keep walking over here, when you, when you look around, there's, there's like, there's eye candy everywhere. And, um, 
One thing that caught my attention was this Aprilia RS250. And like I said, it doesn't have to be a Ducati to be here, but this is really cool because this is kind of my childhood, you know? We, I was around these bikes growing up and seeing one here because they're pretty rare in the US. This is a two-stroke 250cc bike. And uh, back in the day, the MotoGP series had 125, 250, and a 500cc series. And uh, you know, this is as close as you got as a consumer to be able to buy it. This is not a factory race bike, but as a consumer, you could buy these. And in Europe, you could actually ride these things because they had street legal versions. And if you look behind, there's even a, um, even a Honda back there and a Suzuki right beside it. There's these two bikes over here. These are factory super bikes of their time. Don't ask me what they are because I'm probably gonna mess it up, but these are the actual super bikes that were raced of their generation. They're not conversions or anything, they're factory race bikes. And uh, you know, when you look at them, it's just crazy, you know, for because they are old, but there's carbon fiber everywhere, and I bet you they're all magnesium wheels and everything. That was the, the top of the line for its time. This place is a, you know, you know, it's a full service shop. And I mean, when you come right here, they have a full on paint booth that they paint all kinds of stuff. Mainly, I guess they're, they're painting a super legera bodywork for, uh, for a race bike. This is pretty cool. This is a uh, full six rear subframe that's being painted over here right now. Other than red, I think this is one of my favorite colors on a Ducati is this uh, fluorescent orange. But let's, uh, Let's try to find Chris because he also has the bikes that is in his own collection that he's raised. So maybe he could uh, tell us a little bit about them. I was winning. I was winning like five to six a weekend on that bike, and there was like ten to twelve races a year. What series was it? It was CCS. Okay. Yeah. We That's also crazy. raced Azra. We raced uh, Formula USA. This weekend is not about drag racing. This is it. The We're a Pro Formula USA series. This weekend is all about road racing. There was another series called Nesba. We have raced it in that too. Um, this. This bike that's like blackish gray, mm -hmm. that was my first Ducati race bike. That bike was silver and orange and it was a 750. Like when I had that bike in 97, 98, people would say like, oh, if you're gonna go race in CCS Florida that you're not gonna be able to win because Chris is there and he's unbeatable on that bike. And that bike was making 86 horsepower. It was still a 750, mm -hmm. it was a two valve and it weighed 270 pounds or something like that. So it was really How much like does the stock one weigh? Like four, 460, something like that. With, no, with nothing, with no battery, no gas. But how, how, we, how that so bike long? had no electric start, no charging system. So every, every seven lap race, you had to put a new battery in it. But how, how do you guys get it so like light down to like 200? You have to get fucking, you have to get crazy. You have to get, everything was carbon and like lightweight fiberglass. We cut the whole back half of the frame off mm -hmm. and we just left it off. You know, you didn't need it, you know? Everything was like that. It was so minimal. And then um, when in 03, when the bikes became fuel injected, mm -hmm. things got way easier. So we actually started riding the bikes that were a little bit heavier mm -hmm. just because they would start every time you hit the button, you know? Yeah. You know, it was, we, and then the other thing is, once we, once we started racing bikes with electric start, you could have multiple bikes and you could do multiple classes that were back to back to back and we mm -hmm. did that a lot. Well, as long as it's not easy to go through a bunch of races too though, right? No, I was, Physically, I was doing nine a weekend on most weekends. Crazy. And, that, and so what they do is Saturday's practice and then on Sunday, there's nine races. So you have to do them all in one day. Um, and then uh, in 2000, I think it was 2015, we were racing Arma, and uh, they, I would race 
I would race, I'm trying to remember exactly, I'd race four races each day, mm -hmm. and it rained on Saturday, so they moved all the races to Sunday. And that weekend I was doing six races, so, because I was doing two vintage bike races, mm -hmm. I had to do all 12 races in one day. Holy cow. And most of them were back to back to back to back, like you didn't ever got a break. Yeah. yeah. The, the crazy part is that you gotta have like the endurance to do it, right? Yeah. I would lose 20 pounds in one weekend. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean it was all like you look like you you look like you were sick when you got home, you know, on <laughs> Monday morning or Tuesday. What was morning. the drive behind it? You just wanted to you just enjoy racing or well honestly the the lady that ran the series, I'm like, hey, can't you do something about this? You're, all these races are all back to back to back. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's like, what are you, a pussy or something? <laughs> <laughs> she's like, get out there and do it. You're way younger than everybody else. <laughs> and in, in Arma, it's like an older crowd, mm -hmm. right? And when I came in, I was like the young kid, you know? Okay. Yeah, so I, uh, what, what are you going to do when the lady tells you that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to go, ah, fuck it. I'm going to go try it, you know? Exactly. This whole line of bikes is mostly, with the exception of that silver bike, that one's not mine, but... Um, that blue one was mine, and then all these bikes, most of them are my old bikes, except when you get into the 851s. The, those bikes down there were a couple of friend of mine's bikes that passed Did you away. race any of these, or are there? I've raced, I've raced most of these. This one I've never raced because this bike's all original. This mm -hmm. bike won the championship in um, 2006 in, uh, in the UK. It was mm -hmm. a world, or a, an English superbike. Um, was it a BSP bike or? It was uh, it was super stock or super okay. sport. It was one class down. It's because this is a 749, okay. not a 999. Mm -hmm. um, these were the, the last two super bikes I raced. Um, this is the A bike and that's the B bike. Um, they have really trick electronics and stuff like that. Um, that 748 right there is a 748 RS. And uh, it has 996 RS suspension on it. Which one, the first red one? The yellow one right here. This is one of my absolute favorite bikes. It's just one of those bikes that you can give it all the throttle all at once, and the tire just takes it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never, ever crashed that bike. And the blue bike, I've had some like mid-air collisions, but I've never fallen down. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like there's, there's been a couple like where the tail section got ripped off and stuff like that, but I never hit the deck on it. Oh, holy cow. Yeah, so those two bikes have never been crashed. What, what, makes, the, what makes the yellow bike take all the power? Is the suspension jump? I think it's or? because it's a 750. Okay. It doesn't have the torque. And it's a higher revving motor. It's happy between 10 and 12 or 10 mm -hmm. and 12 and a half. So yeah. when you're on it, it's such, it's such, such a high RPM. It never, really, it never really has the chance to spin. It, it kind of like goes like that. And once it steps out, it's hooked. You know it's hooked. Okay. Yeah. And I've won a lot of races on that bike. The blue 996 RS, I have like my outright fastest lap times at Homestead are on that bike. How Even fun. Do you remember the times? Yeah, 125. Holy cow, okay. Yeah. This bike, I, I got close to matching it. I was within a couple of tenths. Mm -hmm. But on that bike, I could do it over and over and over again. And this one, I could barely do it. What is this, 1098? This is or? a 1098, yeah. yeah. And it's basically... Um, an RS, it has over 200 horsepower. Jesus. Um, but what happened when, when the horsepower came, the bikes became harder to ride and they were much heavier. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of extra stuff on this bike that that bike doesn't have, like electric start. That bike has no electric yeah. start. Um, this is like the start of the modern bikes, Yeah, this is the last bike that still feels like the 996 and even a, you kind of feel a little bit of a 999 in here sometimes, mm -hmm. but when they went to the Panigales, everything changed and they they became a more modern bike, but you almost had to relearn how to ride those bikes. What, so, what, what was it, the engine, like the power characteristic or the just power, the chassis? The chassis. Yeah. Um, when the, when the- um, Well, I guess this was the last trellis chassis too though, right? That's right, why? Right, and it, and it was kind of like what we knew the best. And then when they came out with a new bike, it was like an alien, you know, I was yeah. like, where did this thing come from? And we couldn't get it to carve like these bikes were carving U-turns. Mm -hmm. um, we were starting to think that they wouldn't carve. And we went to Daytona and Boulder Motorsports was there with Shane Turpin riding. Mm -hmm. 
and he was like on fire that day. And he was racing against a Kawasaki that had insane top end. Like it did like, I don't remember what it was, but it was like something like 220 miles an hour. Yeah. The Panigale was doing 211. And then there was another Japanese bike, I believe, that was just as fast. These are all like super good riders. Mm -hmm. I think one of them might, I think the Kawasaki might've been Huntley Nash, and I can't remember. But basically when those guys were out there, we were, we were in the International Horseshoe and the Ducati was carving harder than the Japanese bikes. And we were like, what the hell did they do? And later on we figured it out, but they, I think Boulder was the first ones to figure out how to get the bikes to carve, you know, the, the Panigales. Well, what but that, was it, like, you know? Like, what, what it was, was it uh, It was geometry in okay. the front, yeah. Um, and it was also like springs and better forks and stuff like that. But we were like not really building those bikes because we couldn't get them to turn. And we needed like a little bit of help. And all we really needed it was to see that it was capable. You know, yeah. we we're starting to give up hope a little bit. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, those bikes are fast. But it was a different riding style. It was never, it was never my favorite bike, but the transmissions of the Panigales were night and day difference. Oh yeah? yeah. This like is better? Like, this is like antique stuff compared to those bikes. <laughs> Yeah. What, yeah. what are those there, the, the gray ones? I know one is Carl's bike, right? Both of those are Carl's oh, bike, actually all three. Oh my God. So cool. this one is a 800 Super Sport that he just finished a couple of months ago. Um, it looks like he really wanted a KTM, but he's got a This is what we call it Home Depot orange. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted it to be that color and they were having an issue with the paint. <laughs> it's mainly because of the 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 problems with COVID, they can't get the powder in the neon. Really? So because they couldn't get the powder and it became Home Depot orange, they painted the body so it would match. Yeah. But, um, so, but that's a, that's an 800 Super Sport that's like, every part on that bike is modified. And it's been, and it's had like, in its lifetime, it's probably had 40 owners. Really? You know, and, and hopefully now that it's his, it doesn't sell again, but He's, he's done so much. He put the magnesium wheels. He just updated the swing arm. Um, Al in service, mm -hmm. he cut the back half of the frame off. And this, he remade all this in aluminum. So the whole back half of the frame is aluminum. That's like a 1098 tail or is that? This is a Panigale. That's oh, a Panigale tail. Yeah. Well, that's, I knew it looks familiar, but. Yeah. So it's like a Frankenstein. Kinda, yeah. That one's his Paul Smart. He built that two years ago. It took two years to build that. I remember coming here and seeing it in pieces on the, in the back over there. And you see him like drilling holes and bolts and <laughs> doing stuff to make it lighter yeah. while he's waiting around the next part. It, um, it took forever for the parts to get here, but that bike was built on a, a customer, like not a customer, it's like, it's like one of us that work here. Yeah. And he had to buy parts as he could afford it, you know? And he's begged, Traded, you name it. <laughs> Stole stuff. Not really. <laughs> he he calls it borrowing when he needs something from me. But it stays here after all. It's not taking it home. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I mean, I could pretty much lock it in forever. Um, that is his 848. Um, he kind of he kind of got to the point where he just stopped riding it. I really don't know why. Mm -hmm. But he. He's, he loves the bike, but he doesn't love to ride it. Um, I think it's because it's too fast. What happens is when you get, when you get into water-cooled bikes, that one's an 848. I believe it has a big bore kit, but I'm not sure. When, when you build them like that and you make them faster, it, it becomes like kind of scary to ride it, especially like at the other end of the straightaway mm -hmm. when you're getting and you're coming into the braking zone. Yeah. Your, your brain isn't as fast as the bike is, especially at our age, you know? When Stefano race, uh, sorry, Stefano Mesa rides it, he, he's doing wheelies sideways on the rear wheel and it's like nothing and, you know, but he's much younger than we are, you yeah. know? But oh, it's, cool. it's super cool. Um, there's like a whole backstory on the bike his girlfriend gave it to him for Christmas one year and it was a street bike and he, He's like, I'm never gonna ride this on the street. 
and like in a couple of days it was stripped and it was down to the frame and the, the exhaust the piping on the exhaust is huge yeah it's 70 millimeter is that like a race race this is a this is a system that you could buy from a Krok a Krokovich, but it's it's is like the the system that they had in Parts Unlimited and everything. But yeah. now they don't make it anymore. Everybody wants to buy this exhaust off the bike. One of the things like when we work here, we sometimes forget about what the rules say in the rule books, and it's not because we want to break the rules. It's just because we want cool shit on our bikes. Yeah. So what happens is we keep making them faster and more trick and all that kind of stuff, and then it maybe puts us in a class that's like too high up. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is he races it like maybe maybe once a year in Arma and then he does track days with it occasionally and that's it. It barely ever goes anywhere. But everybody loves it. It's like, you know, they love this paint job and people walk by and they're like, ooh, how much is that? You know? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, guys, Carl. Would he sell it? <laughs> Everything's for sale, right? He says uh, no, but I say yes. <laughs> Cool, you know perfect. that there, you, there used to be almost twice as many because I sold most of my street bikes when I got hurt. So okay. there was, there at one point there was two rows like this, if I, not I remember, more. I remember you had two rows. Yeah, you should have seen what, the, there, was, there was one bay at the old shop that was just basically my bikes. And the guys were like, how much money in rent do you think we paid just for your shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, there's a four letter word for you. <laughs> uh, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris. Well, thanks for showing us around. Yeah, anytime. And it's a pleasure. And uh, if you guys ever want to uh, get anything done on your Ducatis, or even if it's not a Ducati, um, please check them out. You know, we, we, we do refer, I barely refer people around because I know how I'm picky. So if anything that I can't do myself or I don't have time, it always comes to Chris and they always take care of it. And also, you know, we do street bikes, we don't do track bikes. If you guys ever want to dip your toes and get on the track or want to do one of his uh, ride and ride programs, check him out. We'll put his uh, website on the link description below. And you guys always can just Google Motocourse for a lot of them. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to help you guys out. And uh, let's go check out those wheels. Let's get those tires mounted and then we'll head back to the office and we're going to weigh the different wheels. As you guys see, we don't mount our wheels. Chris's shop mounts our wheels, so and let's get back there. All right, cool. For the sake of documenting the process of this build, and I know you guys are going to ask us questions about the weight of the wheels, what I did was we grabbed the scale and we got the stock wheels. This is the stock rear wheel off the R1M. We removed the rear rotor and the sprocket off of it. I'm just going to get the weight to compare it to the OZ Racing wheels. So we have it at 16.1 pounds. I'm going to grab our OZ Racing wheels. This is another set that we have, just so that we could wait without the, without the tires. You could see that it has the spacers already intact as well and the sprocket carrier for a fair comparison. This is at 11.6, so we're four and a half pounds lighter in the rear wheel. This is our stock front wheel. We've taped up the spacers because they fall off pretty easily. This is at 8.6 pounds. And here's our OZ racing wheels. As you could see, it does have the spacers on it so that's 7.7 .7, lighter in the front so four and a half in the back 0.9 in the front that's 5.4 pounds lighter overall the stock wheels of the r1ms are already magnesium 
but they're a different type. They're magnesium alloy. They're not a forged magnesium wheel. That's why they're a bit on the heavier side, as opposed to these wheels, these OZ racing wheels that you see, these are actually special editions. Um, they do not come like this. These are special ordered and we kept one set for our build. We got a few more sets remaining. These are forged aluminum wheels. And just so you can see that we're already saving 5.4 pounds and it gives us a lot of margin for safety in terms of not running a composite wheel. We're running still a metal wheel and it's fairly lightweight. That's the weight comparison of the wheels guys. And I know some of you guys are gonna comment saying that we have to have the rotors on the, on the wheels to be able to balance them properly. As you saw, they did not take any weights anyways. And the rotors should be pretty straightforward in terms of the, the balance of them since they get balanced from the factory too. But yes, I know some of you keen viewers like to comment on stuff like that. It's just, we did not have the rotors installed at the time, but they're not gonna make a big difference. Either way, we're still gonna throw them on a balancer just to make sure that they're balanced. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't think they're gonna need any weights on them regardless. Next on the R1M series, I wanna get the bike on a dyno, but we are working with other people's schedules. So if we can't get on a dyno, because I really wanna see those power figures as much as you guys wanna do, we're just gonna go ahead and install the wheels and rotors and the 520 conversion kit on this R1M so that we have some content for you guys. And also I wanna keep going with the transformation of these bikes. I really wanna thank Chris for taking his time to show us his shop, open his doors, and also take us through some of the bikes that he had there. We had to condense this video quite a bit so that we could put all the content on it. But if you wanna see the full interview with Chris, you can check out our YouTube channel. We'll have the full length video for you guys to watch it because there's a lot of stories and cool bikes that Chris was showing us that you don't wanna miss out. And we do get questions from time to time saying how to get these products. All the products that you see on the video should be always linked in the description below. So you can just check that out or just jump on our website, www.motormillion.com. If you guys liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. Until next time, guys, have a great one.